All right, so we'll talk of, uh, about endoscopy um, and uh, touch on, on pancreatoscopy uh, a little bit uh, for chronic pancreatitis. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, the role of endoscopy, and we're, we're going to focus mostly on pancreas duct interventions. Um, there's, there's other stuff, uh, things like gastric outlet obstruction, biliary obstruction, um, you know, perhaps vascular complications, gastric varices. We're not going to touch on those too much. So uh, defining chronic pancreatitis sometimes is a little hard, uh, and uh, uh, but you know it's it's easy if you have a pancreas specimen in your hand, you can have the histology. But clinically, sometimes it's hard uh, to make. It's a, um, uh, a, a I like to think of it as a spectrum, a syndrome, and when it's really bad, it's really easy to diagnose. Um, it's difficult when you have mild chronic pancreatitis or minimal change pancreatitis. Sometimes when there's acute on chronic changes, uh, and sometimes there can be a, a discordance between what you think might be a functional insufficiency versus some of the structural findings. Um, when you define or look at chronic pancreatitis, it's, I, I think, two big buckets to look at are those with uh, a non-dilated duct versus dilated duct, because that has some implications for drainage procedures. The first thing that we're going to talk about in terms of the role of endoscopy is diagnosis with the U.S., and uh, it's often very useful, particularly in subtle uh, chronic pancreatitis. There are standardized criteria that we use when we look at the pancreas to decide if there's chronic pancreatitis present, um, but they're not all uh, kind of 100%. Um, uh, the ductal stuff is perhaps a little bit more, more useful. Uh, sometimes we find some of these parenchymal stuff in someone who's completely asymptomatic and may or may not you know, really have chronic pancreatitis, they may be smokers, they may, you know, have gone out last night uh, for the faculty dinner uh, or, or, or whatever. And, and so you have to be a little careful when you call some of these things. Um, but the more criteria that are present, uh, the more confident you are. So this is kind of normal pancreas, um, you know, nice hyperechoic salt and pepper homogenous gland with a non-dilated duct. And here are some U.S. findings of, of an abnormal pancreas. You can see some of the ductal findings in the first few panels, um, and then uh, what we call echogenic strands, um, which, which correspond to fibrosis. Presence of calcifications is, is highly suggestive, as are the presence of pancreas duct stones. Pancreatoscopy is occasionally useful for diagnosis, uh, particularly in the setting of an incidental dilated pancreas duct and someone who typically uh, didn't, didn't have a history of, of pancreas illness uh, or, or risk factors for chronic pancreatitis and maybe doesn't really have pain. And here what we're talking about is trying to differentiate uh, chronic pancreatitis, oops, uh, trying to differentiate chronic pancreatitis from uh, IPMN. So this is a video courtesy of possibly a video well, there's not. All right, well, take my word for it. It's a video courtesy of uh, Steve Kim that showed an IPMN with a nice kind of uh, friable uh, cluster of eggs in the pancreas duct uh, that was typical of uh, an IPMN, and, and you wouldn't see that in chronic pancreatitis. Um, so that's just kind of diagnosis. Most of the time, what we're talking about the role of endoscopy, we're thinking more managing the complications. And really, we're talking about the painful complications for the most part, although there are others that are important. It's important to understand that uh, pain is a, a complex feature anytime you're talking about the GI tract or other parts of the body. And there's many sort of causes and targets and pathophysiology of, of pain. Um, primarily, though, we're really talking about ductal hypertension relief. And so uh, that's where we can help, uh, but that's not really the, the only cause of pain. So you can perfectly uh, drain someone's pancreas and they can still have pain. You can remove their pancreas and they can still have pain. So it's, it's, a, little, it's a little sometimes of a, of a tough situation. It's not a black and white um, uh, entity. So our approaches, you know, we have a number of tools, uh, and this is just a you know, brief review. Uh, usually there's some kind of a papillotomy. The uh, 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 pancreas sphincterotomy is less precise and defined in its completion compared to a biliary sphincterotomy, so we have to be careful about uh, making sure first that we don't have, cause a complication of perforation by cutting too much, but also uh, don't cause delayed complications of stenosis by not 
cutting enough, and that's sometimes not, not so easy. We have stents, we have stone removal and stone destruction, and often these are uh, in combination. Uh, and so here you can see a, a pancreatogram of a, of a big fat uh, duct with a stone uh, kind of at the head, but also a stone way out at the tail, and those are two different kind of animals. So the approach is, is basically to improve ductal flow, remove stone, treat, uh, treat strictures, and uh, you gotta be uh, somewhat careful about uh, patient selection, um, inadequate response to medical therapy, and, uh, and obviously medical therapy is not exactly uh, robust for chronic pancreatitis, and so most folks are gonna have inadequate uh, response to medical therapy. But more importantly, you wanna make sure you have amenable targets that you have uh, determined a priori priority RCP by either US MRCP or CT scan. Um, and compliance is an issue. If you put a PD stent in someone or multiple PD stents and then they disappear, you can have sometimes uh, very significant infection, abscesses, life-threatening sepsis. So if someone doesn't look like they're gonna follow up or there's insurance issues, um, you may have to think about other options, particularly perhaps surgery, because that may be a perhaps one and done situation. So uh, the rationale of endotherapy versus, for example, surgery is that it's efficacious with low morbidity and carefully selected patients. It's repeatable, should it need to be. It doesn't get in the way of surgery. It may predict response in surgery if you achieve endoscopic drainage and there's pain control, but you don't think there's going to be a, um, a durability, you can think of surgery. And if someone is a poor operative candidate for whatever reason, sinestral portal hypertension, liver disease, otherwise, uh, it might be an alternative. So here's kind of a summary of the world literature uh, as of a few years ago of, uh, of the long-term outcomes. In general, there was about 1,400 patients. About a quarter end up going to, to surgery. 15% uh, still need endoscopy. Two-thirds don't really need for, for the treatment. And these are all kind of just, you know, a descriptive series of, hey, this is what we've done. Um, they're not randomized trials. They're just kind of like a, a, a conglomerate of, of experience from different centers. So uh, let's talk about PD strictures. The first thing is whenever you see PD stricture, confirm as best you can that it's benign. Imaging, EUS, um, you know, uh, confirm that you're dealing with something that isn't a uh, cancer. Um, uh, is it amenable to endoscopic intervention? It's focal as opposed to diffuse and somewhat close to the papilla as opposed to way down and associated with an upstream dilation. Not amenable would be multifocal, multiple side branch and stones, diffuse stricturing, inflammatory mass, this sort of concrete glob of, of evil in the pancreas head that you're not going to ever really do, you know, much with a little by French stent. Um, so in general, you know, there's a bit of dilation, uh, stent placement, perhaps multiple parallel stents, um, and uh, eventually trying to upsize and eventually trying to find a, a stent-free trial. You don't necessarily need to have complete stricture resolution uh, to provide long-term benefit, uh, but improvement is, is good to see fluoroscopically. So in general, technical success that's reported in some of these uh, series is more than 90%. That's probably a little bit of an overestimation. Sometimes it's easier said than done. But what's important is that technical success and clinical success is not the same. Uh, just because you can put a stent across the stricture doesn't mean that someone's pain is going to be better. Um, complications are not, you know, uh, rare, and uh, often there's post-procedure pain and pancreatitis, stent-related uh, issues of migration or occlusion, infection, and uh, some folks can, can get quite sick and die uh, occasionally from these complications. So stones uh, are, are present in a lot of folks with painful chronic pancreatitis. What's important to understand about uh, stones is that they're not the same as, as bile duct stones. Uh, importantly, the presence of stones doesn't mean that there's pain. The removal of stones doesn't mean that pains will, pain will go away. However, some patients clearly benefit from stone removal. I personally often use the index procedure of a good stent to predict if it's worth going down the path of uh, sometimes difficult stone destruction removal. Um, it's possible that the ideology of chronic pancreatitis in terms of the importance of stones may matter. In India, there's a lot of literature about very impressive endoscopic interventions for pancreas stones, uh, but their pathophysiology tends to be tropical pancreatitis as opposed to alcoholic pancreatitis, and that may be a different animal, perhaps. Um, it's harder to remove PD stones compared to CBD stones and associated with somewhat higher complications. So again, you wanna kind of think of an amenable target 
um, uh, what's very challenging sometimes are stones upstream of strictures because it's sometimes hard to open those strictures large enough to allow removal. Stones that are present way out in the pancreas may not be amenable to, to removal and frankly may not really be uh, causing the pain. So the approach again, a good sphincterotomy, opening uh, a stricture uh, for larger stones or stones associated with strictures, some kind of stone destruction may be necessary. Stone destruction of pancreas duct stones is harder um, or difficult because they're harder, I suppose, um, than a bile duct stones. And so um, lithotripsy of some sort, including increasingly uh, the use of pancreatoscopy and a laser or EHL. And then removal by standard techniques. I often think a basket's a little bit better because a balloon can sometimes push stone fragments into side branches. Uh, smaller stones, less numerous stones, uh, non-impacted stones, these are, uh, can be removed generally without major lithotripsy uh, maneuvers. Um, uh, when those are not, uh, those features are not met, sometimes you have to think of lithotripsy. There's a filling defect there in the pancreas duct. If every pancreas duct stone could look like that and be there like that, that would be lovely, but that's usually not the case. So talking about pancreatoscopy, you know, S-Wall is used more in other countries than in this country, and certain centers have it. Uh, I think you have a machine in Mayo, don't you? Yeah. So they're lining up uh, S-Wall uh, around the block in Rochester. But uh, in Los Angeles, it's not terribly, I think Cedars may have one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the urologists have it. Uh, good luck getting them to zap the pancreas for you. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, in practice, if you don't have it in your own unit, pancreatoscopy is your real other option. Um, a, lo a lot of the literature for as well efficacy is, is also um, in countries with uh, tropical pancreatitis, which may be kind of, like we said, a different, different animal. Um, when we look a little bit more at pancreatoscopy, uh, the technical success is actually uh, pretty good. You know, there's been a few uh, papers and sort of experiential type papers uh, series coming out that uh, over the last few years that suggest that, you know, technically it, it's, it's successful. But again, you know, technical success and clinical success don't mean the same thing. It appears that laser lithotripsy for pancreas duct stones may be more effective than electrohydraulic lithotripsy. For bile duct stones, it's kind of six of one half dozen and other, other kind of point and shoot. Uh, pancreas duct stones are a little more resistant to, to destruction. Uh, adverse events are not uncommon and um, uh, often there's post-procedure pain. So in general, uh, stone clearance can be achieved, not quite as, as highly successful as bile duct stones, uh, but uh, success can be increased when combined with lithotripsy. It's important to understand that technical success and clinical success are two different things. Coming out of the duct, you guys you know, probably know about EUS guided or, or CT guided or, or fluoroscopy guided um, uh, celiac nerve interventions. There's a number of ways to do it. Uh, it's, to me, it's primarily a cancer pain intervention um, and a very effective one in, in a lot of cases in that situation. When used for benign disease, it's a little bit kind of wild west. Some folks really like doing it. I think in, in, in some folks, you get enough relief to get them out of the hospital, uh, but their recurrence is fairly high. Uh, I personally avoid neurolysis for chronic pancreatitis and, and prefer to use blocks with steroids and, and anesthetic, but some folks use neurolysis for benign indications. So that's the aorta, that's the celiac artery, and you just kind of point and shoot your, your injectate right there. Um, in the last few minutes, we'll talk briefly about surgery versus endoscopic therapy. There's a few randomized controlled trials that have suggested, in fact, that surgery is more successful. And those are not new trials. You know, this is 20 years old. Um, and uh, they, they've had some flaws, but they're still you know, uh, widely quoted by both surgeons and gastroenterologists. Here's another one. Um, and then they had a long-term follow-up. And, and all of these kind of favored surgery, um, but you know, it, we're not kind of ha having the doors knocked down of surgeons operating on these folks. I don't know how it is in Mayo, but um, it's still not, I'm, I'm sure in your experience, not a common surgical intervention. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First is probably that in those trials, they were probably highly selected folks that don't necessarily meet real world criteria that someone would want to have an operation like that. So it's, 
I think it's important to understand that for the right patient, surgery may be a really good option. Uh, but it, rather than think of it black and white, um, it's probably better to have a, and this is the answer for most things, multidisciplinary discussion. Uh, okay, so uh, just uh, some conclusions. EOS gives you really good structural evaluation of the pancreas and uh, can, can often uh, diagnose subtle chronic pancreatitis. Um, it's uh, occasionally useful to use pancreatoscopy when you can't tell the difference between chronic pancreatitis and a main duct IPMN. Endotherapy is a, an option to manage pain in carefully selected patients, and we have a lot of techniques, usually in combination of, of improving ductal drainage and ductal hypertension, which is an important, but not the only, pathophysiology in painful chronic pancreatitis. And as always, if you're unsure, ask a friend. Thank you very much.